My name is Lionel Sosa. I was born in San Antonio, Texas in 1939. I grew up on West Commerce Street near Zarzamora. It's in the, in the, in the 07 uh, zip code, which uh, today is one of the poorest in the country. And I'm sure that it was one of the poorest zip codes in the country back when I was growing up. Uh, and at that time, uh, Lanier High School, where I graduated from, was a vocational school. They taught us Mexican kids how to repair cars, how to do carpentry, how to do printing, and all those other crafts that, uh, that kids at that time were expected to do if you came from a Mexican background. We were good with our hands, so they said. Uh, but one of those courses was commercial art, and I loved art. So for three hours a day, I uh, was in shop, commercial art, and then I had ROTC, and I had journalism, but it wasn't really journalism because I was the makeup editor for the school newspaper, so I just made paste-ups and put pictures here and there and all of that kind of thing, so the only real uh, real subject that I had was uh, world history. So I graduated uh, with straight A's, but really with an educated education totally unprepared for college. But college wasn't even in my mind or in the mind of my parents even. You know, at that time, uh, you graduated high school, that was an expectation for me. I was about, I, I, I had to graduate from high school. Uh, but college was never discussed. And out of 180 uh, seniors at Lanier High School in 1957, only three went to college. I was not one of them. And uh, you were expected to graduate, to get a job, uh, to marry, to have a family, to work hard, to be responsible and to keep working hard and keep working hard and then you die. So the expectations were very low. Well, I began a career because uh, I think I always had big aspirations and uh, I thought that because I could draw and I was good at graphics and I was good at lettering that the whole world would open up for me. And my parents made me believe that. They said, you don't need to go to college. You know, you can draw, you can paint, you can be a painter, you can do anything. And uh, so I really thought I could do anything I wanted to. But they also said you can do anything you want to as long as you work twice as hard as the other guy. Because let's say that here you are and you are a Mexican kid, you're Mexican descent, you gotta understand that that's a disadvantage and that if it's you and an Anglo and that you are both as good, the Anglo will get the job every time. So you have to be twice as good. Then you'll get the job. So always be twice as good as anybody else. And they were not racist, it was not us against them. My dad had a cleaners at that time. Prospect Hill was mostly a German and Belgian community. Our clients were Anglos and so forth. So it, but it was a fact that she brought forth and uh, without any malice said, you gotta be twice as good. So she taught us to be twice as good and to work twice as hard. My very, I aspired, I thought I was the greatest artist on earth. And after a short stint in the Marine Corps, I was in California, I thought I'm gonna use this time to get a job at Disney Studios. When Walt Disney sees my portfolio, he's gonna immediately put me in the office right next to him and I'm gonna work for him and help him build this uh, massive organization that he's already built. Uh, and uh, I spent about four months after uh, getting out of the Marine Corps, stayed in California, built a portfolio, and took my portfolio to Disney Studios, and they said, uh, very nice portfolio, but we're fully staffed right now, go back home. So I was stunned. I went back home and uh, found that uh, I had to start making it on my own. I was still living at home and my parents had a rule. 
Once you graduate from high school, first thing you do is get a job. If you want to stay at home, half of you, whatever you earn goes to pay rent. So uh, I uh, had to get a job so that I could do, do, do something, you know. And so my father says, look, why don't you start painting signs? Put a sign up there that says uh, signs painted here and uh, somebody will stop by and you'll get work. So I started as a sign painter. Uh, and uh, pretty soon uh, got a uh, job at a sign company. It's still around today, Texas Neon. And my job was to make little miniature to scale uh, pictures of signs that if they were built and they, if they were sold, then they got to be built. And so I got to see my little creations become great big signs on poles and stuff like that. I think one of them may still exist, skate uh, out on San Pedro. One day I was uh, in my little cubby hold and there was an office right next door uh, and it was a sales office and people would come in to say, I've got a Victor's Cafe and I need a sign that says Victor's Cafe and they would talk to the salesman. He would then give me the information. I would make a picture. They would go sell it. The sign would be built. But one day, a lady by the name of Sally Pond came in, Sally Pond, and she said, I want a sign for my school it is called the School of Personal Achievement. And I needed to be under the canopy of this sign. And she gave the, she was, I was overhearing her as she was giving the salesman this information, the School of Personal Achievement. Hmm, that sounds interesting. So I went and I butted in and I said, what is that? Oh, she said, it's a school that'll make you a millionaire. Really? Oh yeah, if you go to my school for 17 weeks, I guarantee you that you will become a millionaire. I thought, wow, that sounds like a hell of a deal. And uh, the whole course at that time for 17 weeks was $250. So I managed to scrape up $250 and I took that course. And every week she taught one of the principles uh, based on the book Think and Grow Rich from Napoleon Hill. And uh, the very first one is have a definite goal. The number two was have your mastermind alliance. You'll never do anything alone. You always need a, a, a team to help you and so forth. And it, it, it was from five in the afternoon to eight o'clock at night. And then they gave you homework every week. You brought it back. Uh, and they really drilled these principles in every student and I really took it to heart. I saw this book, uh, you know, what did I know? Hell, she said that that would happen. A book said that that would happen. If, because a mantra was whatever your mind can conceive and believe you can achieve. So all I had to do is conceive it and then believe it and I would achieve it. Let's go. So I took it to heart and uh, I really applied all those principles and they really, really set me in a new direction. My goal that really began uh, when I finished the course was to have the biggest and the best graphic art studio in Texas in five years. So I applied the principles, I wrote that goal down, I read it to myself six times a day as they say you should do. And uh, you know, the, the ideas of how to do it and, and when to do it and all that just came as if by magic. And uh, within five years I had the largest graphic house in Texas, bigger than any in Dallas or Houston. And we were doing work for everybody around here, mostly South Texas, and the logos for Church's Fried Chicken, for the National Bank of Commerce, on and on and on. We had a going little business. I had 28 graphic artists working for me, and I was also doing the artwork for all of the local advertising agencies. And one day I decided, you know, my next goal is going to be to have the largest advertising agency in San Antonio. And uh, so I decided, okay, I'm going to turn my art studio into an ad agency. 
but I wasn't thinking very accurately at that time because most of my clients were advertising agencies themselves and when I became an advertising agency within a month they all cut me off and they found other other people to help them so it was very very tough the first year but we were able to secure accounts little by little the convention and visitors bureau uh, the King Ranch uh, and, uh, uh, and and other large enough accounts to where in five years it did grow to become the largest advertising agency in San Antonio and it was called Ed Yarding and Associates and uh, we uh, were able to put together a wonderful team of very talented people that could do work just as good as any advertising agency could in New York and uh, so when the first news of the growing Latino population became national there was a big cover story in Time magazine about this new Hispanic consumer that was going to be the biggest consumer market ever uh, was developing, I decided, you know what, I'm going to do that. I'm going to concentrate on Hispanic marketing. So I started another agency and I called it Sosa and Associates, and, uh, which became Sosa, Bromley, Aguilar and Associates. And that grew to become the largest agency, the largest Hispanic agency in the country. And again, using the same principles I had learned from uh, uh, Think and Grow Rich, uh, that happened with a definite goal, getting together the right team and doing the best work in the world and working harder than anybody. So it was just the same principles my mother taught me, you know, be twice as good as anybody else and work twice as hard as anybody else. And in many ways, that's the magic formula, I think, for just about anybody. If you work harder than the next fella, and if you work smarter than the next fella, and you have a product that's twice as good, uh, you're going you're gonna to achieve your dreams. There's no doubt about it. My career in politics started with a U.S. Senator uh, by the name of John Tower in 1978. He was running for his third term as U.S. Senator. He had taken over uh, the seat that had been occupied by Lyndon Johnson when he ran for when he became vice president, and uh, they seeked us out. They saw they s were looking at the quality of work and so forth. We got a call from one of his staff members and said, "You know, we like your work." Uh, by that time, there were four partners in the agency: uh, uh, two Anglo's, two Latinos, and great work. So he needed. Uh, to secure the Latino vote in Texas in order to make sure that he won because he knew it was going to be a very tight election. As it turned out, uh, on election day, the Latino vote got him reelected because he won by one half of one percent and the Latino vote for a Republican went from eight percent to 37 percent and that was national news you know no Republican had ever gotten that big a percentage of the Latino vote that that became that became a story uh, it, it, it became a local story a Texas story but then I got a call from from John Tower and he said well Lionel uh, you know you guys did a great job for me and I just want to I just want to ask you what can I do for you you know Here's, here's a fellow, you would think, okay, he's reelected, he forgets about the people that... No, not John Tower. He was different. This man was different. He cared about his people and the people that worked for him and worked with him. And he says, come on over to my office. Uh, uh, I'm going to be in Texas on such a day, and I'll be in Dallas. Come on over and let's visit. And he said, how can I help you? And I said, well, can you get me some more business? He said, I'm going to do something better than that. I'm going to do two things. I'm going to introduce you to the next president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, and I'm going to call the Wall Street Journal and tell him that you helped get me elected by making sure that I had all the Latino votes that I wanted. 
He makes a call right then to the reporter and he puts me on the phone with him and uh, we have a long conversation. Uh, he came in from wherever he was and we had uh, a, an interview. N next thing I know, my picture's on the front page of the marketing section, those little drawings that they did, giving me more credit than I deserved for his win. And uh, lo and behold, we just started getting national advertisers coming to us. So within three months, our agency got five times bigger just because we had accounts like Dr. Pepper, Bacardi Rum, and Coors Beer that were spending millions nationwide. So I knew that that's what I wanted to do next. There was a big market here, there was less competition, and I thought, man, I'm getting into it. But he also, by him introducing me to Ronald Reagan, and Ronald Reagan giving me, in one little sentence, I think, the key to reaching the Latino, I was able to, I think, take that philosophy and make it work for him, for uh, George H. W. Bush, for uh, George W. Bush, and uh, on the eight presidential campaigns that I worked on. And, uh, you know, that was almost a fluke, but, but it happened. I think I'm amazingly lucky to have kind of fallen into that, you know, but it, I can tell you it's a lot of fun when you're working for, uh, in a presidential campaign, when, and especially when you're on the winning side and then you get to know uh, you, you know, and become a friend of the president, that's nice. He said, I, I, when I was introduced to him, uh, the man that introduced me, John Tower said, this is the man that helped me get elected. He knows the Latino market like nobody else and I want him to work for you. And he said, great, you know, he says your job's gonna be very easy. And I said, well, I don't think it was that easy because, you know, 8% is what a Republican usually gets. He says the key is just to have Latinos are conservative, Republicans are conservatives, Latinos are Republicans, they just don't know it because they know that all they want is opportunity. They're hard work, family, all of those things that your father and mother told you about life in America are true. That's the way I think. The way you think is the way I think. The way your parents taught you to think is the way I think. Just to fuse that philosophy and then make me part of it and you've got it. So it, I don't think I spend more than three minutes with Ronald Reagan but he gave me the key. No wonder they called him the great communicator. He knew how to take something that seemed almost impossible and put it into words that were not only possible but understandable and actually applicable. We, we worked on, uh, on uh, George W. Bush gubernatorial race where he got 49% of the Hispanic vote then we worked on the 2000 campaign where he got uh, about 41 percent of the Latino vote nationwide and then in 2004 when he uh, the New York Times actually reported that that he had gotten 47 percent although that's debatable by other polls uh, but uh, yeah he uh, he he did very well and, and then uh, uh, you know uh, so, so that was the last winning race that I had any part in. I did work for John McCain, and I did work for Newt Gingrich, uh, but uh, the, the, the big one, I think, was the second election of George W. Bush for me. Right after that, I was asked to, uh, uh, to, uh, to be a fellow at Harvard at the Institute of Politics, and uh, I taught a course there I uh, actually did research for a semester, 
Uh, and the question to the course that I was uh, going to teach, that I was assigned to teach, is to spend a semester to discover why it is that we have this small group of very, very, very poor Latinos that are succeeding at Harvard. They come from the poorest of poor families, yet here they are, while their siblings are on welfare, some in jail, uh, and not in a good position, but they're here. Why is that? So we spent a semester, and we found that the answer to that was very simple. They were at Harvard, even though they were extremely poor, the poorest of the poor, because someone, when they were very young, told them they could. A teacher intervened and said, you're smart, you can do it, you will do it, I will help you, you work hard, and you'll be at Harvard. And the kid believed it. The kid believed it. That, I think that moment to me was golden because it revealed a truth that I had never talked about. If you tell a kid that they can do something, they'll do it almost every time. If you tell a kid they can't do something, you can't go to college, you won't go to college, you're not smart enough, you gotta come home and you gotta help the family because you're poor, that's what they'll do. They're every bit as smart and they're every bit as talented and every bit as hardworking. But one believes that they'll go to college and they'll go to Harvard and they'll be successful at Harvard and the other one thinks I can't do any of that. That's why we eventually started Yes, Our Kids Can, which is my current endeavor and the one that I'm most excited about. This is uh, bigger than, uh, than working for Coca-Cola or Anheuser-Busch or Procter & Gamble because it uses advertising techniques to influence people to do one thing instead of another. Advertising influences people to buy one product instead of another. Now we're using the same techniques to get a poor kid thinking like a rich kid. A kid that lives in poverty thinking like a kid that lives in, 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 in prosperity. So if we can put the thoughts of this child that lives in prosperity where he's been told you're going to go to college, you're going to be successful, you're going to earn a lot of money, you're going to be a good citizen, you're going to be a good parent and so forth, and you put it into the head of this little kid, then this little kid thinks like this other child does. So we're doing that with Yes Our Kids Can and we're doing it in a way that will reach every child that's poor in public schools today. We're doing it through the school system, through the school districts, and we're reaching their parents with the same message. It's one thing for the child to believe that he can or she can, but if their parents don't believe, then it only gets them so far. We want them to get as far along as, we, as they possibly can and start as early as we possibly can, and that's pre-K. Instead of waiting till the eighth grade to do some remedial work as the system does today, we're starting in pre-K so they won't need that remedial uh, learning in, in, in the eighth grade. So if we start in pre-K to saying you can do it, you will do it because you're smart, I will help you, then they will believe that. And we're very excited about it because first indications are showing that it's really working. First indications are saying that this is something that could actually turn the tide on poverty and would uh, disrupt this whole cycle of generational poverty. I, I think that, that when anybody succeeds, uh, it has to do obviously with providing a good service for somebody, uh, working harder than anybody, delivering a better product than anybody, and then believing that you can. Napoleon Hill's philosophy is whatever your mind can conceive and believe, you can achieve. 
sometimes it's easy to conceive. Well, I can do this. But if you don't believe it, you really can't achieve it. You've got to learn to believe that you can do something. That's what we're teaching these kids in school, to believe that they can do it. If you tell somebody often enough that they can, and you keep repeating it, and you keep repeating it in a way that they will uh, understand, and that they will uh, that will entertain them in a way that'll be that, that that they like to receive the message. If you tell them, give them a positive message, and do it in the right way at the right time, often enough, they will believe anything. And you gotta have a, a positive attitude. You gotta be an optimist. You gotta think. Not, I don't know, I, I, this is what I'm going to do, I believe that I can do it, I know that I can do it, and it's going to be a lot of fun. You know, if you're making beautiful things with friends, what can be better? And that's what I'm doing now, and I'm very, very lucky.